Hi, I'm Tim Leahy, and today we're going to talk about HIV transmission and pathogenesis. So when we talk about sex and the other things that transmit HIV, there's a hierarchy from high to low transmission. At the top of the hierarchy is sharing needles. If, if an injection drug user pulls a needle out of their arm that has blood in it, that includes HIV, and then an HIV negative drug user puts it right into their arm, it's incredibly likely to transmit, probably one in a hundred, if not more likely. Anal sex is more likely to transmit than vaginal sex, and in either case, the receptive partner is at greater risk than the insertive partner. Oral sex absolutely transmits, but it's much less likely than the other two to transmit. And then, you know, the major things that influence the likelihood of uh, transmission here are how much virus is in the source patient's blood. Are there mucosal lesions like sexually transmitted diseases that might, you know, sort of impair the barrier to transmission? Is the recipient genetically resistant or not to infection? And then is that virus a little more likely to transmit? It's important not to uh, forget these other modes of transmission, though, that still around the world there are thousands and thousands of children who get HIV from their mothers either during birth or breastfeeding because the mothers aren't able to get uh, protective treatment. And then, more rarely, there are other exposures, either transfusions in countries where the blood is not screened adequately, or healthcare exposures, you know, say a, a surgeon doing a procedure on an HIV-positive patient in whom there's a mishap. If you focus just on sex and you're educating patients about the likelihood of transmission, the number to remember is 1 to 900, meaning that, that if you sort of, you know, know that couples do a variety of things in the bedroom, you don't, you know, different couples do different things, and you don't really know exactly, you know, in what time was transmission that, you know, occurred, but you just have the couples record what they did over the course of a year or two, and then look to see, you know, what the risk of transmission was according to how many times they did what, it boils down to about 1 in 900. But, you know, I think it's impossible really to sort of pinpoint when a patient comes to you and says, you know, doc, I did this last night with this person, at this, you know, in this way. I think it's really hard to know exactly how likely it is. You might be able to say that was not going to transmit, but, but exactly how at risk they were and what does that number mean? I don't know. I think there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I think that just emphasizes the fact that condoms are good. So what if protection was not used or if it failed? What happens when HIV transmits? Well, here is a histo histogram of, uh, uh, or a histology of a, a rhesus macaque vaginal epithelial layer to, uh, in green, and then the, the nuclei are in blue, and, and you can see these little orange dots. This is HIV that was added to the vaginal lumen, and it's now just sort of diffusing passively into all layers of the epithelium. If you wait a little bit and stain differently, these bluish cells are those same epithelial cell nuclei. But now brown immune cells, or more specifically CD4 positive T cells, are stained here. And you can see that these little specks, these black specks of virus, are starting to cluster around these immune cells. What happens is, is that the virus gets into these immune cells, their preferential targets, and then they replicate in those cells and they make more of themselves. And so you're partly seeing virus going to the cells and partly seeing virus come out. And what happens is that you sort of get this exponential expansion of HIV where the first target cell then transmits to more target cells, which then transmit to more target cells, and you're getting increases and increases in the number of cells uh, and the number of viruses in the body. What happens? Well, massive loss of those CD4 positive T cells. On the bottom left, you can see these, this is a, in the Peyer's patch in the gut where a lot of CD4 T cells reside. And these brown staining cells after infection on the right are nearly completely lost. In fact, you get about 60 to 90% of those cells are lost within two weeks. And it's not just any old CD4 positive T cells, it's actually the ones you need the most. It's activated cells that are ready to fight infection. It's memory cells that remember what you've been exposed to and know how to fight it. And it's actually sort of, ironically, the HIV-specific cells. The ones that go to fight HIV are the ones that are clipped off and killed earlier. So, you know, a mystery came up early on, which was, you know, really, if you look, you know, maybe 3 5% of CD4-positive T cells are infected. And so why are so many of them destroyed? What, what process is going on? Well, the answer here is chronic immune activation. And the idea is that HIV sort of breaks a paradigm that's in, in place for acute infections, not chronic ones like HIV. The idea is that infection is de detected, and in order to fight back, immune cells get activated, including T cells. And then those cells are pre-programmed to die so that you, know, you don't get an autoimmune process. You're supposed to sort of cure your cold and then get rid of those cells that are making snot so you don't have a snotty nose for the rest of your life. But if infection is uncured, then new cells are recruited, and those cells undergo cell death. And then if the infection is not gone, then, then new cells you know, go through that process. And so you're just losing cells, losing cells, recruiting new cells, recruiting new cells, losing cells, and this process continues. And essentially what the end you know, point of this is that you lose the conductors of the immune system, those CD4 positive helper T cells. This leads to immunological deficiency. So the fight is on. You know, the, the virus is attacking the immune system. The immune system is fighting back with cytokines and various other tricks it has up its sleeve. 
And, you know, we'll talk in class about what that feels like clinically to have HIV infection early, knowing that there are some symptoms then, but really for most of HIV, it's asymptomatic. And so how to diagnose it is a trick. But suffice to say that along the way, there's sort of a slow, silent stalking. The immune system is being damaged progressively, even if there are no symptoms. And one major key to this, the fact that that, that infection is not cured, and the fact that the immune system has to keep on shaping it, chasing after it, has to do with viral mutability. I've got a picture of a chameleon here. So it turns out that, you know, the math will tell you how invidious this process is. So the, the virus is about 10,000 base pairs. And its viral replication machinery makes a mistake about one in every 100,000 base pairs. And so that means that about one in every 10 viruses is newly mutated. Well, so it turns out that the virus is incredibly good at replicating. And so there are 10 billion new viruses a day and somebody who's not treated. And, you know, you can do the math. That means that there are about a billion new viruses every day in the body of somebody who's, you know, not being treated. That means it's an incredible ability to evade some sort of selection pressure, whether it's the immune system or a drug or whatever. And one way it does this is this process called viral escape. The idea is that, you know, this immune cell notices the invader and it says, I will defend the homeland. And it starts to fight back. And as you know, it, it targets specific peptide sequences in the virus. But then the virus just mutates itself. And so it's a new monster. And the immune system doesn't know what to do. And, ah, mommy, it has to, it has to find some other way. And, and actually, in fact, the, you know, the, the, the T cells also change what they're targeting to try to fight that new virus. And then you get a new, new virus that mutates after that. And eventually, that incredible um, mutability of the virus wins out. Thus, the chronic immune activation that lasts for years and essentially leads to AIDS. So, you know, HIV transmission happens during things like sex, which we sort of can't stop doing as a human race. It's not hugely likely per sex act, but you might have recognized this as adults, that sex is happening a lot. And after it happens, these, this sort of malevolent immunopathogenesis occurs, and you get, you know, sort of this really disturbing progressive loss of critical cells in the immune system and, and progressive inability to contain HIV and progressive immunological deficiency. And we'll talk in a different uh, video about what that immunological deficiency looks like clinically. But I don't want to destroy you here. I don't want to, you know, ruin your day. So I want you to know that there is hope and we will talk about the medicines and other ways we have to fight back. So ridiculously simplified, here is the summary. There's about a 1 in 900 per sex act risk, all told, averaging everything. But man, lots of things impact this risk. So I sort of try to focus on prevention through condoms abstinence, being faithful, um, but, uh, but you know, uh, patients want to know, and so it's good to have the number in mind. If infection does happen, CD4 positive T cells are the major targets of infection, and the biggest thing that kills them is apoptosis. Viral mutability and viral escape are big pieces of pathogenesis, and the end result is immunological deficiency, but, but there is hope. I'll see you next time.